Uh, well, welcome to uh, Libertarian uh, London meetings, and uh, we meet here every month. You're welcome to come along every month. I hope you do. Uh, we'll be doubling the price next next month. I hope that won't pick you off. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, tonight we have Bob Layson talking in uh, about money, what he's seen and what he's obscene. Fiat money, what he's seen and what he's obscene. That's close enough, and I'll try to approximate to that. Um, yes. Uh, it, as you will recall, as he used to say, or oh, Batman, as you will recall, the last time I spoke here, I was throwing concepts, concepts out of economics like a baby throwing things out of its pram. And tonight we're all the same, pretty much. Maybe the world. I foolishly, listening to the, my brilliance, <coughs> intermittent brilliance, I, um, I noticed that I laid myself very wide open and you all resisted the temptation. Because last time I said, um, well, out goes equilibrium, certainly general, and even singular. Out it goes, out it goes. It's Newtonian mechanics, it's da, 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 away with it. Out goes equilibrium, even out goes coherence. And what's left? And none, none of you said incoherence, which, <laughs> which I then provided you with. No, no, no. So. It's something similar uh, this month. Um, how to jump in? Uh, we assume that we have money, and you know why money is a very good thing, though not too much of it, necessarily. More is not better. Um, for the purposes of specialist production and exchange for cash, well, there has to be the cash, and there has to be, have to be prices freely formed, reasons um, Mises and Hayek gave, Mises especially, uh, they have to be market prices in order to tell one production plan, one business plan, it comes, the business plan, it sort of envelops the production plan. And the, uh, the cash constraints are such that you select between business plans incorporating production plans, because the business plan may incorporate financing the whole scheme, one way or the other. So that's... Um, that's where we start off. Now we know we, so we have to have money, and money's there. Uh, can money be uh, scarce? Well, individually, we sometimes say, you know, I'm a bit brassic. Uh, for foreigners, that is um, Cockney rhyming slang for brassic, lint, skint, means you're without money, without the readies anyway. You may be um, a wealthy man, unlikely, but you have, uh, you have no cash. Uh, but that's, in, that's the particular. It's been pointed out by many an economist that uh, there's always enough money, uh, providing it can be uh, subdivided into small units and practically uh, made use of in that way, which it can, especially um, with modern advances such as a, a kind of gold equivalent of Bitcoin, whereby something which may, will be difficult to handle in very, very small amounts can be easily handled if you're simply electronically moving it from one, or rather, having one owner replaced by another owner. So, Indeed, I've, um, I sometimes toy with the idea of, well, the, with the analogy. Just imagine that, and it would have been a wonderful place, everyone just used gold. There was, there was some of it lying around, and some of it most, most places in the world, and, and that, was the, uh, that was the coinage. And then it was thought, well, it's, it's a bit silly to transport this stuff hither and thither. And um, someone had the good idea. We'll put it all in one place. We won't actually move the gold. We'll simply um, change the owner. So we have labels moved from one to another. That's without having to transport the gold. It can, and it can be safeguarded there, looked after. And um, so everything went on merrily that way. It was as good as, you know, as, good as gold. The fact that you had a proof that you had it, or perhaps paper coupons would be issued such that would prove your entitlement and there wouldn't be more of an issue than there were things to which people were entitled and they were only entitled to known persons. Anyway, if you imagine such a circumstance and then imagine that the earth opened up and swallowed all the gold. Uh, not everyone knew this at first. And then it was realized that, well, just carry on with the accounts. It's, it's as good as gold, isn't it? I mean, providing that you only get gold from someone who actually had it, and it's passed to someone legitimately who gets it and it was freely transferred. It wasn't done by 
reading the books or something. And that, of course, is a kind of uh, Bitcoin arrangement, though it hasn't got the blockchain, though that could be put in, I suppose, if one wanted to go that way. So that's just, just a way of showing that it's possible to have, to have um, a commodity coinage without having to carry the stuff about in little jangly bags or whatever. Not that that was done much anyway, because they, banks did, in effect, the same thing. They changed the ownership of the gold in the vault by, by book entry. Anyway, that's just one way of uh, getting us in into this. So, um, but what of credit? Uh, if there can't be um, a shortage of, of money, in one sense, why, what is the need for credit? Well, credit can be many things. And they're, they're, the meanings are slid one from one to the other, very often. I mean, you can credit someone, credit, credo, beliefs, if your neighbour borrows your uh, your plough to use, just after you've used it, you trust him, you give credence to his affirmation that he will return it in good condition at the time agreed upon, and he does so. Now that is a form of credit. Or you're allowed to pay later at the, uh, the grocery shop, whatever it might be. That again is a form of credit, or trusted. But in the banking system, it becomes an entirely different thing altogether. Or at least, uh, not simply Rothbardians would claim such a thing. Uh, whether, whether it's some um, chicanery, high-handedness, deception, fraud, theft, a kind of um, counterfeiting, well, I, I'm not sure about all that, really. Um, as I've said in the example of, of the gold, it may have all disappeared. So it's not really a fraud. Everyone knows it's not there anymore. But we know that this much value of it was, um, was owned by him and has now been properly transferred to him. So it can be done that way. So um, I don't go along with those who would simply say uh, uh, fiat currency, especially if it's notes, uh, need be wrong or counterfeiting or fraudulent. Because as with the gold disappearing example, one thing you have that might be a proof that you have gold that you owned that gold would be a note bearing certain numbers on upon it, unique numbers that showed it was you, or at least it was it was an entitlement to it, which someone may have given you or lost or whatever. But still, it was only one, and it was an entitlement to that one, that one unit or number of units, as it might be. So that that in itself is not fraud or theft or counterfeiting, no. But what is the objection then? I, I put Rothbardians to one side here. Uh, my own objection has never been so much to fiat, uh, no, I can't it, to fractional reserve so much. Um, there, may be, there may be no reserve at all. I mean, you trust the, uh, the investment house, which you also may call a bank, or simply call a bank, but it's an investment house. I mean, from which you get an interest rate. Did you imagine the manager was sat there and they're going to give him an interest rate? That's absurd. It has to be out working. It has to be earning its keep, as it were. And so, of course, it wouldn't be there. There may be enough to cope with people wandering in now and then, having some of their money out or all of their money out. But provided that not enough did it, it was entirely uh, fair. And I don't think it was a fraudulent a scheme. And if it so happened that people never did all turn up at once wanting it, well, what was the harm in it? So I've never seen much harm in that in itself, though I don't care for elastic banking systems. What I did object to was pretending that someone had deposited money that they hadn't deposited and then lending it out. So it was the fiat credit I objected to and not the fact that the money wasn't in the vault. Two things are distinct, or not all the money was always in the vault. No, it was the, it was the fiat credit I objected to. Why? Because that was fraudulent? Well, some could say it's a kind of fraud, because you might say, well, who, um, who saved it? Who was the person before me who saved this? Uh, I'm not sure what they say, since they just tip typed it into existence. So it's difficult to say. Some economists, Keynes and others, I believe, uh, they go through the idea that, well, they're silent on the, the tippity-tappity. But the point is, once it's gone out to um, 
entrepreneurs or producers who have then blown the lot on buying inputs, which they say what they're supposed to do, and hiring people to work, uh, that goes in the bank. Well, various banks. I mean, they've got rid of it. But certain receivers of these um, type of resistance units, um, they don't spend them all themselves straight away. Some of it they put in a bank. And so the idea was that once it's, keep quiet about the, the origination of it, but once it's been put in another bank, or perhaps the same bank, by someone else, and not spent, it's in there, that's savings. It's, it's, it, as Cain said, it's as real as real. It's, it's real savings. In a manner of speaking, Lord Copper, one might say. So, but is this just a sort of um, moral oversensitiveness to this, this carry on? Well, of course, no, because I still, um, I still subscribe to the uh, credit uh, cycle being the business cycle, or being the, uh, the, bus bi the business cycle is the credit cycle under another name, the fiat credit cycle under another name. I still, I still think that is entirely a, a correct explanation of many, many a, uh, a boom and many a bust. Anyway, you'll be pleased to know that I'm probably not up to, and I shan't bore you with, all the intricacies of the relationship between a central bank and the fractional reserve banks and the banking system and the rest of it. I've read it many times, and I'm wiser, but I don't want to talk about it. Um, but still, there we are. So we have the, uh, the, the production of fiat credit. Why? Well, um, I know why banks want it. <laughs> I know why banks want to do it. I know why governments want to do it. They, they're diluting the money stock. And very often driving down interest rates or permitting interest rates to be lower. Of course, people have to borrow at those lower interest rates, and they do. So that's no point, no problem in that side of it, things. I can see why governments um, uh, themselves not savers, to put it mildly, that governments massively in debt would be qu quite agreeable to the idea that interest rates will be lower and um, there's a lot more money out there and uh, the nominal value would decline of um, government debt and the real burden of servicing that debt will decline. Of course, in the meantime, they might be running up more debt at such a rate that they don't much gain from this. So, is fiat credit theft mm, counterfeiting? Mm, is it fraud? But it is certainly disruptive and it is unnecessary. That's the point. If money is divisible sufficiently and ownable and knowingly owned and provably owned and can be transferred in a safe and secure manner, at least the ownership, and people get along with that, that's quite enough. The idea that um, a growing economy requires a growing money supply, and even such otherwise useful people such as Milton Friedman believe this, and we're now suffering from this tenable term, bollocks, pardon me, uh, in this area, um, the idea that there must be 2% inflation. Well, wasn't, weren't these the people who, apart from bringing the inflation in the first place, were fighting inflation? Weren't they, weren't they squeezing inflation out of the system or something? Now it's a jolly good thing, apparently, although it does reduce the nominal value of the debt. But it, I mean, one, one is aghast. At, the, at the, the baby talk in this area, the, 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 the headwinds, the, the tailwinds, the, the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the momentum, the uh, the um, uh, the consumer-driven economy. Uh, you know, we've got to make, we've got to get people destroying things and lowering their value. That's that's the way ahead. Well, that is consumption, and consumption has its good sides. I'll drink to that. But um, production is the matter of importance here, not the destruction of value. Uh, William Hutt is very good in this area. I recommend him. He has his own language, Huttite, where he, he, he so, so carefully explained himself that people 
people's eyes apparently glaze over and they, they move on to someone else. But he's very good. I can, re I can recommend his stuff. Um, where were we? So there's, there can be enough money. And also, let's, let's consider prices are necessary and for that money is necessary. But beyond that, what does money do? How do you use money? Well, you use money by getting shot of it. Seems a strange way of using something. Take no money. Is that what kind of recipe is that? Take no money. No, no. Take an egg. That's part of a recipe. An input. An egg is an input. A recipe is something for using. But money, money is not used in that sense. Unless you unless you mean exchanging it for things that are useful, and it's useful for that. Well, yes, but you've got shot of it. And every supplier, once they have their, their loan, or even their credit, providing it's not t typed into a position, so I have no objection to banks actually lending, I think that's rather what they're, what they're for. Um, no objection to that. So, consider, what is it that constrains Consumption. Well, we have to produce first to write out. So there has to be, have to be supplies, inputs. There has to be a, well, there has to be ingredients and a recipe, and then some work in the kitchen. So you can, can use different terms for these various parts, but that's the obvious thing. But the money is not included. The money is literally not used, and also it's not. It, it's not an idea for doing something. It's not a plan for doing something. It's not an ingredient to be worked up into a product. What then is it? Well, it's none of those things is what it is. And it's all by itself. So the idea that um, the more money, the, the merrier. No, sir. No, no. Money does not supply an idea. It doesn't save itself. It doesn't choose what to buy for a production plan. No, none of those things. Ah, but money finances. Ah, if, and, uh, and, and credit money finances just as well. Well, I can't deny that. There was a chap here some months ago. I may have made him a bit grumpy. He said, as many of Rothbardian would say, and I, I might say it myself some time ago, that you know, fiat credit is it's not money, it's not money, it's not money. And I said, would you like a suitcase full of it? Because I would. <laughs> It'll buy an awful lot, you know. An awful lot of nice stuff. Now, perhaps it ought not to have it, and I agree with them there. But in one sense, sadly, it certainly is money. Indeed, it's the only money we've got. Well, yes, it's the only money we're allowed, pretty much. I think we have to pay our taxes in it, don't we? So, no, prices are vital, and therefore money is vital to get market prices in order to have business plans, which you can rank one above another. That's, that's the Miesian point. That's, that's how it goes. But it is neither an ingredient nor a recipe. Um, prices don't tell us what plans to draw up, but they put certain plans off limits. Um, at other times, I've complained that the idea of, and this is sort of hydraulic Keynesianism, the idea that money flowing around an economy or pushing, or rising, or raising, or, no, this, this mere talk that money provides an impetus. Money has no mass. I mean, quantity money does, but it need have no mass if it's just information as to who owns what, who holds what. It has no mass, it has no momentum has no bulk. It cannot be used to form anything, nor to be formed by those with a plan for forming it. No. It merely has to be there and divisible all the way down. Um, those who object to banks as fractional reserve banks as fraudulent, well, what you do then, you know, this is the 100% the reserve bank you may know of, well, that simply, that simply becomes a transfer house. You can call it a bank if you want, but it's a transfer house. You put your money in there, and then it, it gets used for paying things. That, that, that's all. That, there's no problem there. That, it's, that's not fraudulent. You, had, you put the money in, and they've, they've, they've obeyed your instructions as to what to do with it. Um, 
An investment house will be something else. Now, banks can be very useful if they restrict themselves to these functions, apart from the ordinary ones of just keeping it, looking after it, and sending it hither and thither. They're also quite good. Uh, this, again, it, it's not a matter of a fractional reserve. This is, or it is fractional reserve, which is the unobjectionable part. It's the credit creation objective. So if banks specialise in taking your money and lending it out, in effect, it's only nominally, but in effect, to all sorts of businesses, some a bit riskier, some not too risky, but some, but that may pay more. So the point is, if it's spread out, that's saving you the bother of investing yourself, if it's spread out in tens of thousands of various projects, that unlikely to all fail at once. So it might be a very sensible thing to have an investment house. It may also be called a bank. I have no objection to the word, but it's not. It's not typing its. Um, it's not typing its, its money into existence. You gave it the money in order to invest it, and that means that it will not be available on call necessarily. Or you may have to give a, a month's warning, or it may be a limit on the amount. I have no objection to that. My objection is to state money and um, money creation as being unnecessary and disruptive. Blah, blah, blah. Money moves, drives, and powers a nout. Um, along with throwing out equilibrium and uh, other things, uh, I want to throw out Newton as well. Bringing Popper, hurrah! Not that Popper would appreciate it. Uh, the better way of viewing an, an economy, I don't even like an economies either, but there's just, there's just owners economizing away there. The idea, that, the idea that there is a national economy which has and ought to have a national bank and a national currency, and we all gain enormously from the fact that such things exist. Uh, may I use the B word I use some time ago there? Not so, not useful, not a good thing. Even, even, even Milton, that should be living at this, uh, well, he's, well, he's neither of them are. He thought it was, that was the Keynesian in him, sadly, that it was a good thing that there was government debt and guilt because you could buy them and sell them and adjust the interest rate and such, such useful things. No, there's no need, um, no need for that. And especially, um, David Stockman's quite firm on this, that we now have a system of, uh, I don't call it socialism, but it's, it's central, central um, management of, of money. And it's thought, and we're supposed to be grateful for the, what they do here, because they're driving the economy, they're managing the economy, they're, they're creating jobs, they're keeping up demand, they're, what the, who the, what the, many great things. And of course, it, it should make one gasp and stretch one's eyes. Really good. So, um, what then, uh, for me putting economics in its place, back in the box, and state policy with it? Um, just imagine if there were a, a people that, that used gold or silver, it didn't matter. And they, um, they had, they believed in the importance of property rights and respecting property rights. And these property rights are not the rights of property, of course, they're rights of people. And it's a good thing not to transgress and don't touch it, it's not yours, as my mother would say. Mind that man. How adult you felt when you were 14 and some mother said that. Anyway, those good old fashioned virtues. Uh, that's fine. So we have a population of money users, property owners, respecters of property, and what do they lack? What do they lack? Stimulus. They ain't got no stimulus. Well, in an earlier, earlier talk, I explained that stimulus was wanting to get on or not fall behind in the, um, in the race, as it were, of life. And uh, that was stimulus enough. It, it didn't require the creation of credit or the creation of fiat currency or helicopter money or whatever it, it, it might prove to be. They had a fixed stock of money with which they had become accustomed. They hardly thought about it, really. Well, people think money about 
that money a lot, or what they can buy with money, or what they can't buy because they haven't got enough money. People think of that rather a lot, but they wouldn't think much about the money. It would just be there. And the idea that um, they could be made better off, well, counterfeiters know you can be made better off, <laughs> in a sense, and thieves and governments. Oh, am I repeating myself? They realise that they can be better off by having, um, having other people's money. Uh, but uh, it's quite, it's quite foolish. What, what is useful? Invention, hard work, or oh, disciplined work. It needn't be hard. It can get less and less physically hard in the modern world, and it is, thank goodness. But it has to be disciplined, and you have to pay attention, and it is a bit tedious, possibly, and getting to and from work can be a, a chore. But it's there, and um, people are uh, taking home more and more, or rather able to buy more and more. And that would also happen even with a, a fixed, a fixed uh, money supply of stocks or stocks of stocks or total supply of supplies. The, the prices would gently drift downwards and uh, the proletariat would know where the advance came from, not the government. I mean, those TV programmes, how do they make that? How do they make that? Why is there no economist brought in to explain how, how they make it? Why is there no policy maker from government brought in to explain how they make it all possible? No, they don't. People know how stuff is made. It's material stuff, an immaterial idea, a set of ideas, disciplined work. That's how it comes about. Invention, saving, disciplined work. Brought to you by politicians? Mm. The economists, well, they work hard, they do their bit. But just imagine if... It, if economists, along with the gold, sank into a big dark hole, I mean, they, they carried on, they were happy and jolly down there. But no economics got out at all. There were just people who respected each other's property, tried to think up good ideas. This is where Popper comes in. Instead of seeing an economy, one sees a process of conjecture and refutation, trying various schemes, in various, various business plans all around the world, the successful ones carrying on, the less successful ones being replaced. In other words, you, you see it less as a sort of Newtonian universe where there is an equilibrium and there are forces at work. You see it more not there are no economic forces, there are producer choices, there are consumer choices. A consumer is another kind of producer, I like to insist, because you take, you take the stuff home. Uh, you don't produce for, for cash sale, but you are no less a producer. That's the idea that women didn't use to work uh, not true. They used to work rather hard, but they weren't, uh, they weren't paid in cash. They might get housekeeping from the husband. In fact, some husbands would give the wife the entire, the entire wage and say, give me some drinking money, please. And not too much. So I know when to stop. Uh, anyway, so in other, in other words, the important thing is discovery of better methods, but saving so as to use these better methods disciplined work according to the method and with the new instruments. That is progress. Is that an economy? It's a population of economizers. Uh, that's a very good thing. Thank you. Thank you Is there any questions or criticisms, David? And then David first then. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, in the, in, the, in the sort of libertarian scale of things that we should be worrying about, where would you put fiat money? And by fiat money, I mean by command money, I state fiat money. Is it, is it a sort of, well, it's, it's a sort of, it's, it's one of those things that we don't need and it has the potential for very bad things if done very badly, but other than that, it's a sort of point of grumbling. Or is it more serious than that, on the sort of scale? If it were simply helicoptered to everybody, in a sense, it would simply drive up prices and not much else. Now, that might give people, it might make it easier and less, um, less of an affront to one's feeling of worth. In other words, some people could take a pay cut, in effect. They're, they're taking a... They're getting, they're getting ever greater nominal wages, but some of them will be able to cut their wages and stay in employment, perhaps. So that might be something to it. 
Uh, but of course, it isn't like that. When it's when it's done by um, Tappy Tappy, to various entrepreneurs who are going to produce, buy stuff and produce. Uh, this is where the Austrian theory of the business cycle comes in. It's it's done. Well, it will have the effect of lowering the interest rate. After all, if you don't lower the interest rate, who's, who wants to borrow it? <laughs> you have to get the punters in, as it were. So, and that was always always it lowered the cost of servicing national debt usually as well. Well, government debt. So, if it's done that way, through um, fiat credit, it doesn't simply rain down everybody. That would be just pointless. But the um, the credit going to um, producers who, who buy stuff. I tried to um, recreate a, a new and improved version of the Austrian business cycle here some months ago, oh, yeah. in about thirty seconds. Well, I'll now do it in a minute if I can. Uh, I've now come to see it goes somewhat something like this. Uh, the interest rate is lowered, yes, yes, yes. Not so much that long and distant projects can be engaged in. It's just that projects that couldn't be engaged in can now be engaged in. And uh, and obviously some longer ones maybe, but also some short ones. If you want to start a dance troupe, for example, and you, you, you can hire the people and get the costumes in, the, in the two days, okay. Um, but you still might say, look, we'll give, we'll give it a chance, we've got to get a reputation, we've got to tour the provinces, we've got to, you know. So we might lose some money to start with. But after a year or so, the chances are we're breaking even, and then we go on and test So we can have a business plan, quite a lengthy one, even though there isn't a long period of production. <coughs> some, some of the Austrians get hung up on the, it's the period of borrowing. It's important, not the period of production, necessarily. Or physical production, because they're producing from the start, the dance troupe. So uh, th that, was, that was one thing. But it will distort in other areas, simply because we have, how can I put this? It doesn't happen all at once. So as with a suitcase full of fiat currency, you can, get, you can buy stuff. It makes a difference. Oh, it surely makes a difference. Yes. Those, those without the currency can't spend it, and those with it can. And they may start all sorts of things. And this will drive up certain prices, but not very much to start with, because not everyone has it. And the, we have, there's not a tidal wave of this stuff coming out. Some Austrian economists speak as if it's just the interest rate difference that makes the difference. But I think it's the great flood of money that keeps the interest rate that low. And it, people want it. <laughs> and it seems to be doing good. And more and more things have started. And that's progress, isn't it? Yes, if there were real saving. But the real saving may be actually going down. Because people don't realize that they aren't saving enough uh, for their future pension or whatever it might be. So eventually, the prices start, start to go up. As you, um, and then, but well, things are booming. People get further and further in debt because you know, surfing the debt is cheaper than ever. And at that point, as I like to now, I like to now see it, which is an unusual way of putting the same. It may, it's the same argument, I think, but put in a different way. That we now have a we now have a population spending like the population it isn't. It's spending money as if it were a wealthier population that was either producing more working longer hours, saving more. But it's only spending more because there's just more money being created, but not, not that. So there comes a point at which, uh, not simply the new, the new businesses fail, maybe some old businesses fail, because there are now too many businesses in a sector, as with housing or whatever it might be. So at that point, the population is not a population that will willingly work 12 hours a day, and then save more, and then also consume more, because we now have more consumer goods flowing on online because of all the capital, all the capital development. So that that is my way of laying it out. It's a different way, I think, of expressing it. I think it's exactly the same, the, the same process, but it's described differently. Uh, very often, it's said that um, there aren't enough, there aren't enough. Uh, inputs to carry on. Well, no, they're not. They're there. They're there. If people would work 12 hours a day, you probably could get the inputs up. But they won't work the 12 hours a day. And also, they've not only got to work 12 hours a day, they've got to save 
to, to justify the new developments and they've got to consume more, well, they might be willing to do that, but they're not willing to work the extra hours and save more. Well, they might have a little more, but they aren't going to work the 12 hours a day, that's the point. So the spending doesn't match the population. It's, it's the spending one might have with a different population or a bigger population or a more productive population. So that's, that's how the things come unstuck. And it's not normally described in that way, but that's, that's the way I like to do it as of now. Oh. Yeah, I, I, What's your name I, wanted make a, uh, Al, I wanted to make a point that I personally believe that fractional reserve credit issuing is actually what you mean because uh, fiat currency creation only happens in a fractional reserve system. Fractional reserve system means that you have, say, up to $10 in your vault and you lend out 100 in other words, creating 90. So just to add to that point, um, that when that money then gets deposited into the other banks and becomes real, you then have 900. Oh, I know how it works. Uh, so so yeah. it, it never becomes real because you just create this avalanche of uh, fractional credit creation. And the only thing stopping that at the moment is obviously uh, defaults. And, uh, running out of people who are eligible to borrow. Um, so you end up with a system where there's an elite of borrowers, per se. So, you know, we don't get the 0% interest rate, right? Certainly not, no. Yeah, I mean, we get 29 or so, right? So... No, 1,250 exactly some right. sorts of payment. So, so really what we're talking about here is actually just a new form of aristocracy. Um, and and it's, that's the whole purpose of it. It's printed slavery. I'm not sure they're that clever. Well, some of them might be that clever. I think the politicians are just... Well, it's not the politicians, it's the bankers. Yeah, some of them just believe the theory that this is necessary and useful and, and we have to bail out the banks. And There was no need to bail out the banks. They weren't all in trouble. There's loads of money out there. There are loads of property out there, owners out there in... You know, own assets they could sell and, and get money and start a, and, and rapidly enlarge a bank or something. There was no need for it at all. And as for buying up their worthless, well, not very worthful investments and giving them good, little good typing. I mean, it's good in the sense they can spend it. Uh, yeah, of course, that was wrong. Yes, well, I, 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 I didn't. I think very little of them. <laughs> These people. That's what it's one of the, yeah. Oh. He was second, I think. Yeah. What do you think about Bitcoin? I like it. I have. Is it four and a half or so? mm. Not very many. And I've, and I've lost me. I wrote down. I don't mind. Say that. <laughs> it's inside a book somewhere. <laughs> Probably there's about hundreds of books. I can't remember where. <laughs> You've got thousands. But it's an investment. If it, ever if it was ever really important, I'd find it. But do you think it could yeah. be based on just an investment that could... It could. It could. Isn't there talk of blockchain now? I know they're, I know they're not going to be the real thing, but ordinary banks are now trying to get the idea of blockchains going on. I don't, I'm not sure in what, in what the respect. The, the software behind it, the Bitcoin is like the, the currency. They're trying to copy the technology, but keep the same fiat. Oh, yeah, system. that's what they want. So yeah. they just want the... They just want to lower the costs of transferring and... Yeah. Make it, yes, make it. People like the idea that they can transfer money without paying anybody. And banks don't like that idea. <laughs> so they get their politician chums to um, come up with something which is almost as good, but you still have to pay, but not as much, perhaps, to transfer your money. Because that's what the banks will charge. I'm sure they will charge you one way or the other. For yeah, they want to keep the centralized system. Mm -hmm. They're copying a few technological. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure that's true. Yeah. David? Uh, I'm not going to say anything about Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Al said, uh, I disagree, Al said that, uh, that you can only have, I paraphrase, that uh, fiat money depends upon the existence of fractional reserve banking. I would say almost the opposite. I would say that the scope for fractional reserve banking is very limited unless and until you have the state standing behind it in the form of fiat money creation bailout. Because if all you had banks uh, competing with each other, some uh, issuing a bit more 
fractional reserve notes than others. Default would keep them honest. Competition would keep them honest. What stops them from being honest is the fact that there's a central bank behind them, uh, which means that, that they don't have to worry about that. Uh, so that we now live in a world where far from people thinking, well, I'm going to choose that bank because it doesn't inflate its reserves much, it's safer. We live in the opposite world, where we hear a constant adverbs telling us, don't worry about your money. You put it in any bank you want, go for the highest interest rate, because we'll, we'll bail you out if it goes wrong up to 100,000, and we'll bail the bank out if it goes wrong up to billions and billions and billions. Can so, I so, well, so, so uh, uh, I think a world in which you had banks <coughs> uh, and customers entering into consensual adult fractional reserve relationships uh, yeah. in a particularly problematic world. Right. But a world where you have that backed by, by central banks is a different story. It is worse. I'm not, as I said, it's unnecessary. And like, and it's almost a kind of aesthetic thing. And no, 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 you don't, you don't need it. You're, you're misunderstanding. It's thinking that more money helps. It helps the person who gets the money and gets it early. There's historical examples from both cases, right? So in the United States before 1913, there was about 37,000 different currencies, versions of the dollar, right? I mean, anyone could just issue dollars, right? That, that was that scenario that you spoke of. So I agree in that scenario, uh, that, that's probably what created uh, the sort of progress in the United States. But what you're talking about with the Federal Reserve, I don't think there were that central many. banks in general is they are the banks. Like this idea that they're the government is not true. They are staffed by the yeah. banking cartel, right? So the Federal Reserve is basically J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, Wells Fargo, right? Um, so, so really what we're talking about is not the government per se. We're talking about a mafia-like cartel of six big banks that don't allow any other banks to start issuing currency the way they do. They've they basically got a monopoly on currency issuance. And so the scenario you describe as a sort of pre-1913, pre, you know, monster Jekyll, High, uh, Jekyll Island kind of free currency issuance. And I, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I think we totally agree. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I think we agree. Ah, but you don't. Is there any, is there any? I think it is unnecessary. Yeah. And it's, it's taken the eye off the ball, which is invention, hard work, well, disciplined work, and <coughs> and saving. If you were in charge of the non-existent anarcho-libertarian government, you wouldn't ban it. Oh, but what, Matsy, show, show me, show me who saved it. Show me who saved that. Uh, they like to say, we're not telling you, but I, well, are, are you going to stop us? Are you going to send around the hippies? I would, I would squat them off the premises, which might be a rather, rather large county. It's their premises. No. The thing is, gold would keep all these institutions uh, relatively honest anyway, right? Because pe people would just say, oh, whatever the underlying trust is, these guys, right? <clears throat> yeah, so it would be a, a less... Yeah. The, the, the lack of trust in these currencies would be more prevalent amongst the... Uh, well, in, in America, yeah. certainly in the early 19th century, the, yeah. there, were, there were books that would list the discount you would have to give to someone's notes. Mm. They'd have to keep changing the discount. And the further towards the middle they got, or for the further west they got, the more they would have to be discounted because they were simply turning the stuff out. Yeah. yeah. But the, but the, every, all the advantages of cash are there if we have a electronic recognition of holdings elsewhere held, as it were, which don't have to move. That's with gold or whatever it might be. There's no one else, David. There's no one else, David. I think. I, 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 I wonder whether we can know that, because if we start from a framework of property rights and voluntary agreements, and we'll give effect to those, uh, and, we'll, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we will see what comes out, we know that there can be different kinds of money. Some will be better, some will be worse, some will be uh, more easily transferred, some may be more reliable, so on and so forth. If it just so happens that fractional reserve type of arrangements emerge on a free market as a result of contractual agreements. Uh, who is to say that that is a bad form of money compared to other things? If, if it's what's emerged, 
as you emerge for a reason. And can we know that that's a, a, a bad way to do it? Shouldn't we just sit back and say, well, let's just let's just see what comes out? Mm. The, state, uh, the state control uh, is, is, the, is the problem. Uh, uh, yeah, there's one of Assuming for the sake of arguments that we've hanged all the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> if it does emerge, um, and there's free competition, then other things being equal, um, only get a normal rate of profit. So then it's not like they're going to get some kind of super profit. Everybody, anybody can become a banker if they want to. Anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you become mm -hmm. a banker, fractional reserve banking is possible. Mm -hmm. When, when you do that, you're going to get such and such a profit. That number of people will then be attracted into banking mm -hmm. so much so that you simply get the normal rate of profit. Ah, yes, it's but not like you're walking away with you, all this money in your pocket. But the normal rate of profit on a larger turnover mm -hmm. is more profit. So what's to stop them issuing more and more money? The press. As in not the printing press, as in the journalists yeah. who will notify everyone of this activity hopefully or well, people will yeah. catch wind of it it's so it'll be a run on the, if, yeah. be a run on the bank if, if, uh, up past a certain point if it's and i just always bank. had a conceptual problem with the libertarian attack on what appears to be a libertarian activity uh, and again i'm not talking about Rough party attack. Yeah. Austrian yeah, attack. Yeah, it's Austrian Austrian attack. Attack. Like certainly rough yeah. it's a it's a it's a Rothbardian attack institution which one could conceive in a moderate form emerging on a true non-state free market and that's all this that's what's struck it's just inconsistent i don't see how you can reconcile on the one hand the proposition that 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 which emerges with on a free market which is not theft and fraud because it's theft and fraud difference for but i agree with you Bob. it's not not theft and it's not fraud, or at least it's perfectly possible to construct it in such a way that, that it's not. Everyone knows what's going Everybody on. Everybody knows what's going on. Yeah. It's a. Uh, uh, so, well, suppose those who objected to it have every right to object to it, and they would say, We want cash in hand yeah. at the, on these, in these premises. And, there'll be and they may lose out because they don't get as much custom as they otherwise would get. But hey. <laughs> don't you let me out something that you don't have? I mean, if, you know, if it's not fraud, then it's not fraud. I mean, I can do all sorts of things. My mind will always disclose exactly what's going on. But we have a set of rules which more or less work, which, which we use to define that which is permitted and that which is not. What seems to happen in this debate is that those rules are suddenly ignored. And what would not ordinarily be regarded as fraud in any other context is suddenly <laughs> said to be fraud because the Austrians don't like it. No, 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 not but because it's fraud. It's, it's, look, but isn't it fraud? I mean, even if, even if the person who, them, uh, who, who borrows the money agrees with what you're doing, the person who borrows the money then goes out and pays someone with it. Well, they don't have to take the note. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't have to take the notes. Yeah, we don't take notes I don't from the National bank. Reserve Bank. Well, well globally, sorry. you have the system. Globally, yeah, you, have you don't money. take Zimbabwean money, right? Yeah. I mean, in, on a global scale, we have this competition. That's what FX markets are. That's what currency exchange markets are, right? I mean, globally, there's always anarchy until we have one more government, which is why they're pushing for it. Who wants to speak next? David? Who else wants to speak after that? <laughs> no, you, 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 you will speak, yes. But you didn't ask my question, Bob. Ah! My question was no. how important oh. is it on the sort of well, maybe yes. scale of worries? Oh. Insofar as the present system of governments, central banks, and fractional reserve banking uh, continues to create periodic booms and busts for which the market gets blamed, then I'm a guinea. I deplore it. Would I outlaw it? Well, I'm not in a position to outlaw it, and uh, but I, I, I'm in. I'm, I am in a position to deplore it, and so I deplore it. Um, but hey, I mean, some libertarians would say that it's the simple most important issue. Ooh. Others pretty much ignore it. Uh, 
compared to war and tax and yeah. regulation, <laughs> that's, that's probably true. Yeah. Well, you, know, you, can't, you can't ensure that you're having tax cuts unless you can stop inflation, which is taxation by the back door. Mm-hmm. That's the trouble. If governments can finance themselves. Pat? Uh, yeah, I'll just say very quickly. <laughs> I, I hope you are quick, Pat. <laughs> 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 you, may talk five quick, hours. you may talk quickly, but you may talk for too long. Uh, go on. Compared to the title of the, the, the uh, talk, uh, a lot of it seems to be going off my head. I mean, I can, I can see what's... It's the, it's the acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's exactly obscene about it? Oh, obs- oh, oh, good, good. Now, I'm pleased we got yeah. to this. You might say tax. Well, yeah. I mean, I think well, income taxes. Yeah, I should have got to that. Well, there's other ways to bankers earning something is obscene, like uh, wide open beaver shots uh, used to be regarded. Sorry, um, uh, but I was referring more to the Lady Chatterley's uh, a tendency to corrupt and deprave. That was it, wasn't it? Obscene, obscene things would, they were obscene insofar as they had a tendency to corrupt and deprave, which in other words means modern economics lessons. <laughs> they have a tendency to corrupt and deprave, I think. I think that the, uh, I think that government monetary policy has, a, has that effect, to corrupt and deprave. Uh, people get giddy or silly or the, the old time verities get lost or passed over. In that sense, it's not in a sexual sense, but it, it corrupts and depraves. And, I, and certainly the idea that that's capitalism, that is, when these banks are bailed out, or worse, there are bail-ins, or in order to return to normality, we have an utterly, utterly abnormal, eight, how long is it now, eight-year period of, of, of astonishingly low interest rates, real interest rates. Negative. Negative. Negative interest rates, yes. Yeah. And that, that did happen briefly in the 60s and 70s, possibly because inflation was such that, but only briefly, and not as a, an announced, isn't it a good thing policy, which it now, it now is being announced. Perhaps they didn't realise what they can get away with. Because they care. Because they're democratic and they care. Therefore, we, was, we don't quite understand what they're doing, but they're democratic and they care, so that's enough. So knuckle down and suffer. I speak of one with money in the bank. Not very much at all. And earning be all interest, I should think. No, no, no. Daddy, you're the only one who wants well, to Well, it's, it's an endless source of useful, you, thank you, Daddy. Yes. useful questions. Yes. Uh, do you, one of the things that, that concerns me slightly there is a risk that some of the Austrian slash libertarian analysis of these issues has been discredited by the fact that we are actually still plodding along without any great disaster. Eight years after, I think, 2008. Have you tried renting recently? Well, yeah, I mean, it's... That's a disaster. Yeah, 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 well, there's disasters and disasters, and if you... If, if you look at the sort of predictions at the time, they weren't well, you know, rented they were like, oh, well, the, there um, were many predictions of, you know, sort of wholesale social collapse, monetary collapse, so on and so forth, and uh, I think I was also, and, well, we might still get it, but, but you know, the, I, I'm sort of vaguely reminded, an analogy is where we were in the late 70s, where again, there were many predictions from libertarians. Uh, Ron Paul, actually, case in point, it's really expecting that, that the world is effectively going to come to an end. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm not I, I, sure I, how healthy it is for the sort of yes. state of libertarian and uh, um, Austrian. Well, yeah, though, though, though I like David Stockman and his stuff, he and others do speak as if you know there will be a mighty wedding and gnashing of teeth and, mm. and whole cities will disappear into. Crevasses. No, no, the, the, the point, if the Chinese make too much of a good thing in certain areas, like airports or you know, cement or steel or whatever it might be, that's not a good thing, especially for all their competitors who might be more, in some ways more efficient. But that is not a good thing. But it, 
it's not as bad as an absolute lack of all this useful stuff. So, so um, eventually, some of it had to be written off, written down, dropped, sold off cheap, given away, abandoned. All of that will have to happen, which is not a good thing. Because in the meantime, it, it gives excuse for governments to do stupid things, in which they specialise. And people are miserable and frightened and likely to vote for who knows what all. So that's, that's the bad side of it. But certainly the idea that um, we were suddenly going to be without bread or I don't know what all, you know. Though he is good on saying, uh, Stockman is good on saying that they weren't going to run out of cash in the ATM machines, you know, which, was, which was the allegation, which is, which is absurd. And the point of information here, of course, uh, me and Bob was going to answer our friend David Steele, who had doubts about the Austrian trade cycle. And in one talk that David gave, he says, when I first started reading the Austrian theory in 1967, they were talking about all these big trashes going to come. He says, we're now speaking, you know, just a few years ago. I haven't seen those trashes. <laughs> this is from 1967. So, you know, you might have seen, had a look at the trashes coming in 1949 when Mises brought his book out. You know, they are overdue, these big trashes. <laughs> But, but anyway, no, we, we didn't anyway. have we didn't have them. We have waves of unemployment and redeployment, and it's not jolly. But it, yes, but it's never uh, the sort of big crash that uh, 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 that uh, Mises predicted. It's not the big collapse of the and the change of the money, the change of regime, as it were. As libertarian act activists, we have to say that it it gives it gives uh, capitalism a bad name and it gives the government an excuse to do stupid things. So. Mm. That alone is deplorable. Yeah. It should be deplorable. Yeah, I think there's just a lot of psychology involved in, in, in this, which, uh, I mean, according to the Austrians, the damage happens during the boom and not during the bust. Mm -hmm. So in, in theory, if the government gets out of the way and, and lets mm -hmm. things happen, nothing bad will happen because the, the damage is already done. We were just, you know, cleaning up the mess and, and, and starting mm -hmm. to use things immediately very, very, um, efficient, more efficiently. So this whole prediction of chaos is basically based on, 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 on psychology of the government not letting loose of, of it and the people at some point lose completely, very rapidly, uh, their faith in the system. And that hasn't happened uh, because people just absolutely are still convinced that the state is in charge of everything and is a good thing. and and. So I, what I'm saying is, it's very difficult to actually predict what's happening if, if so much psychology is, is involved. But what has happened is, we definitely have more and more screwed up the economy. It, it gets more, uh, more and more difficult to make ends meet, to, to, to make a, a, a basic uh, living. I mean, renting what was mentioned. I mean, try, try to rent a, a normal house. How much of your salary you have to spend on, on rent these days? Just, just to have a roof above, above your head, and, and, and so, and so that has all happened. And, and, and to the credits of the Austrians, the the, fi the final chaos is pretty much the only prediction that hasn't really happened. All the other steps in between that they are predicting basically have happened. Just, just to sort of add, when when you speak of a catastrophe, I feel house prices rising to one point five million. That's the disaster, right? Like the disaster, as you said, is on the way up. I mean, houses that are little shacks in Vancouver that are, you know, trash that basically are selling for 17 million. So that's already a disaster. You know, not, I mean, obviously it's not as bad as people starving in the streets, but as you said, it's, it's the, the, the boom is actually kind of a disaster. And a second thing that also plays into this is the geographical distribution on the planet. There is a disaster in Spain, there is a disaster in Italy, there is a disaster in Greece, there's a disaster in, in Syria, there's a disaster in many places on the planet already. And, well, we have the dollar as a world reserve currency, so they're going to have much more control over how they uh, can manage their own uh, sort of decline. Uh, more importantly, though, I think the internet has this, with English as its language, has this big sort of distorting effect on economies worldwide. But, I mean, look at the, the unemployment rate in, in the Mediterranean. I think that's clearly a disaster. There are plenty of yeah. 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 things. Well, I'm from Italy. Yeah. It looks yeah. more like a slow bleeding rather than a, than a collapse by you can feel the slow bleeding. In well, you know, it just doesn't give the big, Bob says, it doesn't give the big grand crash. And you go read that, that the Austrians predict. Pat, would you want to? Uh, yes, I, I, just, I was just going to say about um, if you could suggest an alternative to the, you know, what you were suggesting about fiat currency, 
not to. And, um, <laughs> yeah, not to have one. Um, in fact, you wouldn't have. You wouldn't even need the fear of saying that is the currency. I mean, well. Oh no, we would never. What is, I mean, as far as libertarian, from my own personal opinion, I mean, from the libertarian position, what what is a, a greater threat to liberty is the uh, electronification of money, where people dispense with cash. Well, governments governments would like to have yes traceable transfers Since, and ownership of money yes simply because it's traceable I mean that that's much more important than uh, the fiat uh, currency that you were talking about as far as libertarians are concerned I, I would have thought so especially when you look at the way Europe is going well the world but especially Europe in its um, there was a resolution in. Uh, February uh, 2014, a European Union resolution to go down the road of the Nordic model of socialism. Not, not as bad as it's cracked down to be, uh, well, 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 one I mean, has to say, I mean, in, in all I mean, respects. Yeah, I think you answer. Well, that, that would be, I mean, that's going down, that's going down the route of uh, control of electronification. And so we're doing away with cash. Yeah, let's now, speak to us now, Pastor. Oh, but the, 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 it would be possible to have it, electronic libertarian cash. I mean, there's, that is no objection. That, 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 that's, that was my example of the gold disappearing, but carrying on using the gold records. We know who had it. We know that they've now transferred it to someone else. So you could do it just elect. I mean, there was something called digital gold, wasn't there? Some, well, there, there, there is. About. I mean, Bitcoin is like digital gold. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's traceable, but it's... Uh, there's not a central bank controlling it, so it's effectively... Also, you only know the code, you don't know the person who has it or where they live. Or, yeah, it's yeah. pseudonymous. No. The, the more important thing is about the... Uh, there's not a central bank that can print more bitcoins, so even if you you, you can know how, how many bitcoins he has, uh, there's no one that can steal or that can uh, print. That's the main... You'll have to start a alternative model like Litecoin. I mean, the, what's going to happen there is it's going to be diversification of the marketplace. I mean, there's all sorts of different protocols yeah. jumping up now, Litecoin and Goldcoin and Bitgold, and you know, you won't just have Bitcoin per se by itself. There's already it, like a thousand different yeah. currencies, but so the curious is, thing is that the most successful, which is Bitcoin, is the uh, one with 100% reserve ratios. So you every time you, you know how, uh, Who's the person who has the Bitcoin head? Who has not? There's no, there's you mean no gray. Full, full blockchain. Yeah, there's no gray area. That's completely uh, transaction. Yeah. I could live with that. Even though I do forget my code number. To get at the money. Is that one more here, I think, at least? Uh, really? I mean, it's uh, so not a fast question. You, you would have to have Sterling just stop printing anymore. Yes, that was um, uh, George Stiegler, I think. I said you, you could just freeze the freeze the money at the Fed, and then the Fed becomes a mere um, transfer house, a mere uh, clearing system. The Fed the Fed has no money in itself. It's just what banks choose to transfer through. Then you'd have to fire a lot of government. Well, <laughs> fifty million in the United States. Well, they soon get proper jobs. Oh no, they that, that that would of course help us to cut taxes. That's great. <laughs> Is there anyone else who wants to speak? No, I think we can carry on at the bar or carry on at the bar outside. Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.